Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. On July 17th, the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, visited China. He talked with his Chinese counterpart about emission and carbon neutrality. According to various reports, the intention of Kerry's visit was to pressure China to yield more in total emission. However, after three days of negotiation, Kerry left Beijing without any announcement to make. Observers thus commented, "Keeping communicating is better than nothing." A similar statement to Blinken's earlier visit. While in combating global warming, China has done a lot to reduce its emissions. In 2022, 31.6 percent of electricity was generated by renewable energy. 76 percent of the newly constructed power plants were renewable energy based. 24 percent of all the vehicles sold in 2023 are BEV, battery electric vehicles, which means that they are fully electric vehicles with rechargeable batteries and no gasoline engine. In terms of reforestation, between 2010 and 2020, China has added an average of 1.94 million hectares of forest per year, with a growth rate of 0.93 percent, the fastest in the world. However, despite all the efforts, the United States still blame China for global warming, and their argument is quite consistent: total emissions. According to the UN data, in 2019, China was responsible for 27 percent of global emission, while the United States was 11 percent. China thus generates the most greenhouse gas in the world. However, there's always doubt about relying on statistics on total emission to make plans. China has long argued that it will be more reasonable to look into annual emissions per capita, and things will look a little bit different. If we add population into consideration, in 2019. Each Chinese person was responsible for 10.1 tons of CO2, while each American generated 17.6 tons of CO2. In terms of transportation by land, sea, and air, each American produced 5.5 tons of CO2, but one Chinese generated only 0.7 tons of CO2. You see, when you look at emissions per capita, the average Chinese person emits quite a bit less than the average American. China is a huge country of 1.4 billion people, so it makes sense it would emit more than smaller nations overall. But the United States has only 330 million people, about 4% of global population, yet it produces 11% of the total emission. Where does most of the Chinese emission go? Industry and manufacturing. And where does the products go? The West. The U.S. has less emission in industrial sector, but that's only because the highly polluted sector has been relocated to places like China. Despite all that, average Americans still produce more CO2, and that, my friend, is called the American way of living. Big ass pickup trucks and AC system 24/7. The fact is, the Earth cannot withstand all population to go on the American lifestyle. In other words, the current American lifestyle is based on the fact that most people are deprived of such way of living. It's a privilege, not a right. And John Kerry was not the only American in China this week. You guys remember Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon's Secretary of State and National Security Advisor? <laughs> yeah, our birthday boy just turned 100. A little quiz for you: What's Henry Kissinger best known for? A staunch believer of real politic. Bombing the hell out of Vietnam, having Monty Python writing a song for him, yeah, but none of that could compete with his ability to go to China secretly. On July 18th, when the world is still focusing on John Kerry's visit to China, out of nowhere Kissinger suddenly appeared in Beijing. On July 18th, the 100-year-old veteran diplomat met with Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu. During the meeting, Kissinger and Li engaged in discussions around regional security, military cooperation, and evolving geopolitical landscape. The visit is remarkable not just because of Henry Kissinger's age and his history with China, but also because it comes against the backdrop of escalating tensions between the two countries. Only a month ago, Li and his U.S. counterpart Lloyd Austin both attended the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, but no meeting was arranged. The encounter between Kissinger and Li demonstrates a commitment to dialogue and understanding, even at times of heightened geopolitical tension. While the outcome of the discussion remains to be seen, the meeting itself represents a positive forward in U.S.-China relations. Both China and the U.S. are demonstrating their commitment to finding common ground and working to avoid a major conflict. Kissinger then met with Chinese President Xi Jinping. 
President Xi hailed him as an old friend whom the Chinese people never forget for his historic contribution to promoting China-U.S. ties and stressed that China and the U.S. can help each other succeed and prosper together. The Chinese president also expressed hope that Kissinger and other people of foresight in the U.S. will continue to play a constructive role in restoring China-U.S. ties to the right track. Next up, on July 19th, News of a scalper asking for 150,000 yuan, that's 23 US dollars, for two seats for J. Cho's concert topped the trending topics on Weibo. Known as one of the most influential Mandarin pop singers in the past two decades, Cho is household name in China. Media reports indicate the tickets for all four rounds of his concert sold out within 30 seconds. Without verification requirements, many tickets were purchased by scalpers and listed on jacked-up prices on resale platforms. Some tickets with face value of 2,000 yuan, that's 300 US dollars, were sold for as high as 150,000 yuan. Just a day earlier, another Chinese superstar, Jackie Chun, saw his Guangzhou concert sell out instantly as well. Large quantities of tickets also popped up on resale platforms and social media. Fans are furious. Many blame the ticket platforms who fail to protect real fans from scalpers. In a recent internet poll, over 70% of netizens supported the requirement of real name registration in purchasing tickets. As China's entertainment industry rebounds rapidly this year, in-demand concerts and music festivals have triggered fashionable crazes, but also ushered in ticket scalping and other issues. Chinese authority has labeled ticketing scalping as illegal many years ago. Yet, it has been hard to stop such behaviors. Netizens are eager to see if strict ticket verification system could finally put scalping to an end. Next up, we have two pieces of news regarding China's effort in environmental protection. On July 18, China released a document called Green Recycled Plastics Chain of Custody, marking a significant milestone for the country's plastic recycling industry. The new document aims to ensure the quality control and environmental sustainability standard for renewable plastic products entering the Chinese market by making the entire supply chain transparent and traceable. With the new document in place corporate social responsibility, process control, procurement, sales and outsourcing processes are now under government regulation. This is expected to hold plastic recycling companies accountable for their environmental impact. According to the China National Resources Recycling Association, in 2022, China has recycled 30% of its domestic plastic waste, which is ahead of the world average level. This new standard will help to foster an environmental-friendly economy in China and may serve as a model for other countries in improving their own recycling industry. Around the same time, on July 19th, China successfully connected the world's first 16 megawatts offshore wind turbine to the grid bringing it into operation in Fujian offshore wind farm. With a swept area larger than seven soccer fields, this wind turbine achieves the world's largest single unit generating capacity capable of supplying 36,000 families with more than 66 million kilowatt hour of clean emission-free electricity, benefiting the society and saving the environment. According to the National Energy Administration, China is trending well on renewable power generation with steady rise in investment and solid construction. Furthermore, China has already done R&D for an 18 megawatt wind turbine and is on its journey to a 25 megawatt wind turbine with full independent intellectual property rights following the current technical route. Upcoming mighty giants that bring clean energy, Chinese netizens teased. Next up on the economy, on July 19th, China's authority issued a set of guidelines on boosting the growth of private economy, aiming at creating fair and barrier-free environment for private business, enhancing policy support for small and medium enterprises, and strengthening legal guarantee for its development. Follow-up policy and regulations are also being researched by the state authorities. The world economy is still facing twists and turns while the Chinese economy has witnessed good momentum of recovery in the first half of 2023, with the GDP up by 5.5% year-on-year. The publication of data shows China's future spot in tension in the economy, and Chinese entrepreneurs highly applaud these changes, stating the new policy focused on the current problems and has vowed solutions to our concerns. It's a timely reign that will ensure high-quality economy upturn. However, Despite economic recovery in general, Chinese real estate prices dwindled in June. According to data released by National Bureau of Statistics, 
Out of 70 large and medium-sized cities, including Beijing and Shanghai, only 31 witnessed months and months increase in new home prices. Furthermore, resale prices rose in just seven cities. Despite the evident downward adjustment in the Chinese real estate market, China's urbanization is transitioning from a focus on population dividends to talent dividends, leading to a strong demand for improved housing conditions among residents. Upholding the principle of housing for living, not for speculation, the government continues to support rigid and improvement-oriented housing demand. Next up, China's self-developed passenger jet C919. On July 16th, China Eastern Airlines welcomed the second unit of China's self-developed C919 passenger aircraft in its fleet. The aircraft, mirroring the cabin layout of the first unit, will soon commence operation on the Shanghai Chengdu route. Its arrival marks the fulfillment of the second aircraft in China Eastern Airlines initial order of five C919 passenger planes. China Eastern Airlines completed an inaugural commercial flight of the C919 on May 28, 2023. The aircraft flew a round trip between Shanghai Hongqiao and Beijing capital airports. This successful commercial debut signaled a new phase in the evolution of China's domestic aviation industry. A recent forecast report from the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China predicts that China's aviation market could emerge as the world's largest single aviation market within the next 20 years. Demand in China for aircraft like C919 is projected to average 300 units per year. This demand is poised to contribute over 1 trillion RMB annually to the GDP via the industrial chain cluster. Moreover, it's set to stimulate the development of a series upstream and downstream industries in China, particularly in the high-tech sectors. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you and see you next time.